Welcome to the Red Light Report, your number one source for all things red light therapy, where you will learn how to optimize your health, wellness, and longevity with the power of photobiomodulation. I'm your host, Dr. Mike Belkowski. Hey there, everybody. Thanks for joining me yet again on another week in the summertime. The summertime is typically slow for many things, except for vacationing and traveling. So I know that the traffic with podcasts and otherwise can be a little bit slow. So thanks if you're joining me. Hope you're finding the information useful, applicable, or at the very least, interesting and potentially outside of the box thinking, paradigm shifting. That's kind of what I like to bring every once in a while, get out of the red light therapy tunnel vision, even though Man, I could probably do a podcast every day about red light therapy. But my point being, to give you guys a better perspective, a well-rounded perspective on energetic healing or really how energy and frequencies impact our health for better or for worse, because that alone, having a better overview of the overall paradigm which red light therapy sits under, being energy healing, frequency healing, then we can have a better respect and understanding of how and why red light therapy and other types of light therapy are so impactful for your health and why they can treat so many darn things. Because in in reality, everything is a frequency. I think I said this on a podcast a week or two ago, reading a book. Um, it was the book by Eileen McCusick, Electric Body, Electric Health. But what she said in there was pretty profound in the sense that sound is light that we can hear. And light is sound that we can see. So think about that. In a nutshell, our ears, our eyes, and all of our sensory organs, our nose, our tongue, so on and so forth, are all sensory organs for different types of frequencies. So with that in mind, think about it again. Sound is light that we can hear. Light is sound that we can see. Everything is frequency. And so back to the main topic here, if we have a better respect or a better reverence for frequencies, and that includes non-native frequencies, i.e. Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, 5G, if we have a better respect for all types of frequencies, then we can have a better understanding for our health and how they're impacted by frequencies and really how we can heal these rather uh, or these seemingly intense diseases and cancers, because if you understand the root cause, then you'll also understand how to treat it therapeutically and potentially non-invasively, non-pharmaceutical intervention. And and you guys know I'm a huge, huge fan of that, because if, if that's possible, then you get to take life into your own hands, or I should say your health into your own hands, which is extremely liberating. You're essentially becoming your own doctor in a way and in full control of your health versus being dependent on someone else or another system. Now, that's not to say there's not a time and place to go see a particular doctor or specialist or that there's a time, not a time to get surgery or have some sort of acute medical attention. So so there's a time and place for that kind of stuff. But as far as dealing with this onslaught of chronic diseases that are plaguing not just the U.S., but worldwide, all these basically metabolic diseases, whether we're looking at obesity, cardiovascular, blood pressure, diabetes, the whole gamut, there's been an exponential rise the last handful of decades. And people want to point fingers at diet or people want to point fingers at exercise or lack thereof. If you listen to me long enough, you know that I'm a major proponent of getting down to the root cause of things. And the more that I've read and the more that I've learned, I've garnered a massive improved or increased respect for how light or the magnetic field of our earth or how you can just find other ways to accrue electrons because in the end, the more energy you have per cell, the healthier you're going to be. And that's kind of another way to say the more you can increase your voltage, not necessarily just the longer you'll live, but the increased health span you will have. And, And so as you guys listened to last week, we got some pretty interesting information from Jerry Tennant in his book, Healing is Voltage, specifically in the chapter entitled Healing is Voltage. And so we're going to carry on where we left off from that chapter 
Uh, so if you found last week interesting, we're about to get into some even more profound and thought-provoking material. Again, I will keep saying paradigm shifting because that's just kind of another way to say thinking outside the box or expanding your mind. But this book, and I'm, I'm about, I told you it was about 550 pages. I'm finally over halfway through. He's, he's getting into specific ways to raise your voltage. For example, the last chapter I read was on hypothyroidism and just the dots that Dr. Tennant connects and how simply he lays it out. I guess I kind of understand why he calls this a handbook, even though it's 550 pages, because he really condenses really complex and potentially massively in-depth topics, but he'll condense it into a paragraph or two that's very digestible, understandable, and and sometimes easily applicable to your life if it's information you find that's especially relevant to you or, or someone you know. But again, I highly recommend this book if this type of information interests you or uh, really speaks to you or resonates with you. The link for this book, which I got on Amazon, is in the show notes, so just feel free to check it out there if you're interested. But again, we're going to pick up right where we left off last week. And so this new section is entitled, How Do Cells Normally Get Voltage? So Dr. Tennant continues, There are many ways that the body is intended to get electrons. However, our modern culture has tended to eliminate most of these sources. Earth is a large electromagnet. If you take the electrodes of a voltmeter and stick them into the dirt, you will measure voltage. An area of high voltage always causes electrons to flow to an area of low voltage. If your body has lower voltage than the earth, walking barefoot on the dirt or grass will cause electrons to flow from the earth into your body, recharging you. However, if you walk with shoes, this cannot occur. Water from the ground contains electrons. We call this alkaline water. However, when chlorine and fluoride are placed in the water, it turns into an electron stealer. Thus, every time we drink such water, it steals electrons from us. The water we should be drinking should contain electrons and be clean and free from toxins. Again, you can test your water to see if it is an electron donor or electron stealer by simply placing the electrodes of the voltmeter into the water. If the voltmeter shows minus voltage, the water is an electron donor. If the voltmeter shows plus voltage, the water is an electron stealer. So if you stick a voltmeter into a raw potato, you will measure voltage. However, if you bake a potato or freeze the potato and then insert the voltmeter, most of the voltage will be gone. Unprocessed food contains voltage. Once we process the food, most of the voltage disappears. We are designed to eat unprocessed food so that it brings in its own electrons with it. When you eat food that has been processed, your body must provide electrons from other sources to digest it. You can actually tell the quality of food, such as vegetables, by simply using a voltmeter to compare the voltage in one product versus another. Remember that voltage always moves from an area of higher voltage to an area of lower voltage. When my wife and I hug each other, there is obviously an emotional element. However, there is also an issue of pure physics. The one of us with the lower voltage will get a donation of electrons from the other one. As we continue to hug, soon we will be the same voltage. The process continues when any two living things touch. For example, if I hold a dog or a cat and I am a lower voltage than the dog or cat, the animal will donate electrons to me. Then it will run outside, recharge itself, and bring me more voltage. If I lean against a tree, the tree will donate voltage to me. Moving water is always an electron donor. Still water is an electron stealer. Thus, taking a shower will energize me, whereas a bath will make me tired. Swimming in the ocean will give you electrons, but swimming in a chlorinated pool will steal voltage from you. Moving air is an electron stealer. Thus, people often feel tired if they sleep under a fan. Riding in a convertible is great fun, but you are always tired when you get to your destination. If you take a voltmeter that measures the millivolts and hold it in the air inside your home, you will measure a small amount of voltage. 
Now take it outside. You will find there is much more voltage in the sun. If you take a quartz crystal and squeeze it with a pair of pliers, it will emit electrons. This is called the piezoelectric effect. Our muscles are piezoelectric crystals. Thus, when we exercise, our muscles create electrons. The muscles are also rechargeable batteries. Thus, the movement of our muscles recharges our muscle batteries. Exercise is a major way the body acquires electrons. There is a pump within the skull and down the spine called the craniosacral pump. Each time this pump activates, it sends a surge of electrons through the body. Thus, you can see that the human is designed to get voltage primarily the way our grandparents got it. They worked out in the sun, drank water from the well, ate unprocessed foods, weren't afraid to touch the earth with their hands or feet, hugged their family, leaned against a tree, or stood in moving water while they were fishing and weren't afraid to stand in the rain. The next small little section here, more so just a list, is entitled Common Ways Electrons Are Taken from the Human Body. 1. Acidic water, and that can be tap water, chlorinated water, fluoride, and most bottled water. Number 2. Carbonated beverages. Number 3. Caffeinated beverages, and this includes pop and tea and coffee. Number four, alcoholic beverages. Number five, cooked food. Number six, processed food. Number seven, healer and doctors who touch their patients lose electrons to the patient. Because in that sense, it's implied that the healer or doctor has more electrons or has a higher voltage compared to the patient who is typically sick and and under the weather so their voltage is lowered. So if you're a healer of any type or even a massage therapist, someone who touches humans often and and you're living a high energy, vibrant light and you're treating people with a lower voltage, then you are sacrificing, or I guess in the context of this book, you're donating electrons to the person you're touching. So keep that in mind. Number eight, Hugs transfer electrons from one person to another. Number nine, parent holding sick child. The child gets well quicker and the parent is left tired. And last but not least, number 10, moving air. And this can be wind, air conditioning, fans, convertibles, and hair dryers. And again, those are the 10 common ways electrons are taken from the human body. Well, guys, BioLite has what's called bundles. So simply go to the BioLite website, BioLite.shop, go under products, and there will be a tab for bundles. With each of these bundles, there's three of them, you save 20% off on the entire package. For example, we have the Beauty Bundle, which includes a Shine and Stand, a Guardian Plus, and the Longev Revive Cream. So that bundle of three products, you save 20% off the entire package. There's the Recovery Bundle. That includes the Recharge Plus Panel, the Guardian Mouthpiece, and then the Longev recover cream and that recover cream is just like the revive cream except it has added cbd oil infused into it that package of three items all comes at 20 percent off and then the last bundle which is the most versatile bundle in the sense that you get to pick and choose what products you want you get to pick and choose from the recharge plus panel the restore plus panel or the matrix full body mat and then you get to choose between the guardian and guardian plus and then you get to choose between the revive and the recover cream it also includes the shine and stand so you get to choose between black and silver by purchasing those four products in the ultimate bundle you save 20 percent off all of the products you also save 20 percent off shipping so literally the entire package and shipping is 20 percent off so if you're ever needing some red light therapy products and are looking for a discount just remember the bundles are always 20 percent off 365 days a year no coupon code necessary so that begs the question and the uh, title of the next section here How do cells store electrons? And so this one's going to get a little deep into the physics. I'll try not to go too deep. I'll just highlight what's needed. But again, it's pretty important to understand. So again, how do cells store electrons? So cell membranes are made up of opposing layers of fats called phospholipids. This unusual fat is made up of a ball with two legs. The ball is an electron conductor the legs are insulators. Anytime two conductors are separated by an insulator, you have an electron device called a capacitor. And this is important because capacitors are designed to store electrons. Thus, cell membranes 
serve as battery packs for the cells. And that's especially important to understand or remember. Cell membranes serve as battery packs for the cells because what is taught in subsequent chapters, especially the nutrition chapter, of course, is how deleterious and how detrimental hydrogenated oils such as canola, soybean, so on and so forth, they actually do incredible harm to your cell membrane. So if you think about your cell membranes being capacitors or storing energy for the entire cell, and you're consuming these oils on a consistent basis that are breaking down those cell membranes, so you're breaking down those battery packs, that alone does so much harm to your voltage. And so I'll never forget... Uh, Several years ago at this point, listening to Ben Greenfield, I used to listen to him religiously years back, uh, and he was speaking at an event in, was it Estonia or something like that? And of course, this was in a podcast episode that he released, but I think the question was posed to him, or, or he was just purporting this to the audience, that if you were to give anyone and everyone one tip to improve their health and longevity it would be to remove hydrogenated oils or or trans fats from your diet. That alone. And I remember he even cited the fact that it's because it destroys your cell membranes. And it's like, well, yeah, that's a big deal. If if our cells have membranes and that protects them and yada yada, okay, you know, that's a pretty big deal to uh, protect those. But I didn't understand that those cell membranes were in fact capacitors, or as Dr. Tennant calls them, battery packs for for the cell itself. And so not only are you destroying a protective layer of the cell membrane, uh, you're destroying the the cell's energy source. So that's a pretty big deal. And I remember when I learned that, um, not only did I make that change in my diet as far as removing all hydrogenated oils, all trans fats, and and when you start doing that, and you look in your, your cabinet and your cupboards, and you start considering what foods and packaged foods you're buying at the store, it's kind of uh, demoralizing how many of those foods are lambasted with hydrogenated oils and canola oil and high fructose corn syrup and, and all that garbage. And, you know, you think that eating it once or twice or, you know, once a day is not that big of a deal. But when you understand that it destroys your cell membranes, and as Dr. Tennant says, one of the this is ironic, tenants of health, is that you need to have the ability to reproduce cells um, on a consistent basis. And so again, if you have poor cell membranes that have then low voltage for those cells, and those cells are replicating themselves, so you're getting more low voltage cells, then you're on this perpetuous cycle of the same story as with dysfunctional mitochondria. If you have dysfunctional mitochondria that are replicating themselves, then eventually that tissue that they're in is going to be dysfunctional. If you have too many dysfunctional tissues, you're going to have a dysfunctional organ. You have too many dysfunctional organs, you have a dysfunctional system. So it's something that doesn't happen overnight, but it is sure happening at the molecular level. And so I just wanted to bring that to your guys' attention that A, the cell membrane is a battery pack. B, get rid of trans fats, get rid of hydrogenated oils of every form. Don't cook with it. Don't eat any foods or any packaged foods or anything that has that in it. And so not only did I remove that stuff from my diet, but I went to my parents' house and told them, you need to get rid of all of this stuff immediately. I don't care if it's three quarters full, if we're talking about canola oil bottles, or if we're talking about packaged foods that are open, but like three quarters is available. Throw this in the garbage, give it away, get rid of it. Because that alone will do more for your health than just about everything. And not only is that, I guess, a nutritional thing you could argue, but really, this is more so from a voltage and an energetic perspective. And then moving along in the book here, there's little subsections here on liquid crystals, semiconductors, diodes, transistors. But again, that's kind of getting into the weeds. And I think you'd rather hear nails on a chalkboard than hear me talk about LC circuits and RC circuits, which are resistor capacitor. Yeah, I'm getting bored talking about it. But again, if that's your cup of tea, or you really want to understand this whole principle healing as voltage, those are important sections. But as far as reporting on a podcast, again, I think you would 
maybe just walk away from this episode. But I want you to continue to listen because there's lots of information left in this chapter I do want to get to. And so whenever I have something bracketed in the book, that means it's especially important. So bear with me because this kind of ties together all of the previous points I was talking about with capacitors, microprocessors, liquid crystals, and all that, but in a succinct paragraph. So bear with me. Dr. Tennant continues that, We now see that the cell membrane is the brain of the cell. It is a capacitor that stores voltage for the cell to use. It is a microprocessor that controls the functions of the cell by interacting with the environment around the cell. It is a liquid crystal that can open and close to allow things to enter the cell or keep them out and also allow things to exit the cell or keep them in. It is a part of a Tesla resonating circuit that allows it to communicate with other cells. Remember that every cell is designed to run at about negative 20 to negative 25 millivolts. When cells need to repair themselves, the voltage is increased to 50 millivolts, or negative 50 millivolts, that is. This is controlled by the cell membrane peripheral cytoskeleton resonating circuit. Since the electrons necessary to allow this to happen are stored in the fat of the cell membrane, the fat is critical to the cell being able to do its work at negative 20 millivolts and to repair itself at negative 50 millivolts. Without an adequate amount of good fat, the cell membranes can't function and thus the cell can't function. Remember that cells also replace themselves frequently. If you don't give the cell new building materials, including adequate amounts of good fat, it will have to make a new cell with materials from the worn out cell it is replacing. Building new things using worn out parts creates a new thing that doesn't work much better than the old one did. As you can see, cell membranes must be made with good phospholipids for them to work. Making them with plastic fats, and as a side note, Dr. Tennant calls these hydrogenated fats or hydrogenated oils and trans fats, he calls them plastic fats because they literally make your cell membrane and your cells plastic. And as you can tell, that's not a good thing. So again, picking up where we left off, making them with plastic fats prevents the process from working correctly. Since all of the brain and nervous system, the liver, and every cell membrane are made of fat, you must eat lots of good fat to keep making good cells. A normal person is about 20-25% to fat. That means you need to eat about 20-25% to of your normal body weight in fat every 8 months because your body completely replaces itself every 8 months. And speaking of which, the next little section here is entitled trans fats, or in parentheses, plastic fats. So in the 1920s, food merchants were concerned about the amount of money being lost due to spoilage. They wanted to find ways to keep food from spoiling. They found that if they put certain chemicals like nitrates into the food, it was less likely to spoil. The problem is these chemicals preserve cells in your body as well as the food so they stop working. Cells that don't work are what we call disease. Next, food manufacturers found that if they cook fats at about 350 degrees for about 5 hours, the fats turned into something similar to plastic. Fats processed in this way are called partially hydrogenated fats or trans fats or plastic fats. If you look in your pantry, you will find that about 40% of what is in there contains partially hydrogenated fats. When you eat these plastic fats, your cell membranes become made of plastic. Cell membranes made of plastic won't hold voltage. Without voltage, your cells can't work. Think of a cell with a plastic membrane. It is like wrapping the cell in cellophane. The cell sends out signals that it is hungry. In response, the body sends glucose and insulin to the cell. However, they can't get through the plastic membrane. The cell continues to signal that it is hungry and the body continues to send insulin and glucose. Soon, the cell is surrounded by insulin and glucose, but the cell is still hungry. This is known as insulin resistance and type 2 diabetes. The cell membrane becomes so saturated with glucose that it begins to offload it into fat cells. Thus, people who continue to eat plastic fats get fatter and fatter. Guess what happens to a brain made of plastic? It doesn't work well and then becomes prone to depression, chronic fatigue, attention deficits, brain fog, etc. 
Guess what happens to a liver that is made of plastic? It can't clean toxins out of your system and the toxins build up, causing things like fibromyalgia. Without a functional liver, your immune system fails and you get all sorts of infections, chronic infections at that. Another type of toxic fat is called canola oil. Here's a summary of a few facts regarding canola oil. 1. It is genetically engineered rapeseed. Number 2. Rapeseed is lubricating oil used by small industry. It has never been meant for human consumption. Number 3. It is derived from the mustard family and is considered a toxic and poisonous weed, which, when processed, becomes rancid very quickly. Number 4. It has been shown to cause lung cancer. Number 5. It is very inexpensive to grow and harvest. Insects won't eat it. And I find that most fascinating of all. Insects won't eat rapeseed. And if an insect or animals in nature won't eat something, that should be a pretty good clue, right? Number six. Some typical and possible side effects include loss of vision, disruption of the central nervous system, respiratory illness, anemia, constipation, increased incidence of heart disease and cancer, low birth weights in infants, and irritability. And you can get all of that in a plastic container of canola oil. <laughs> I mean, I mean, what more do you need about canola oil, let alone trans fats or these so-called plastic fats? They do such a detriment to your health, such a detriment to you at a cellular level. And now we know at a voltage level, which as we're learning, is an extremely important to our overall health and longevity. The next section is entitled Eating Fat and Obesity. So the next issue is the belief that eating fat will make you fat. The truth is that eating plastic fat, that is trans fats and canola oil, make you fat. If you make cell membranes from plastic fats, you will keep eating because your cells are starving even while they are coated with glucose that can't get into the cell. Also, eating plastic fats makes a liver that won't work, leading to inability to manage your metabolism. Eating plastic fats makes a brain that can't control your endocrine system, causing your thyroid, adrenals, pancreas, and gonads to malfunction. The paradox is that eating more good fat and stopping plastic fats causes you to become your normal weight. To digest fat, you must have bile. The liver normally makes one and a half quarts of bile per day. Because it makes so much, it needs a storage tank. That is the function of the gallbladder. When you eat a fatty meal, the gallbladder must empty bile into the intestine to digest it. If you don't have enough bile, eating fat makes you nauseated. If your liver can't work well because it is made of plastic or is full of toxins, it can't make enough bile. If you have a gallbladder that is full of muddy debris because it rarely gets emptied, or if your gallbladder is missing, you will not have enough bile to digest the fats you eat. As you can see, this becomes a vicious cycle. You can't repair your liver without eating and absorbing enough fat. You can't eat enough fat if you don't have enough bile because the lack of bile means you will be nauseated when you try to eat fat, and even if you keep it down, you can't absorb it. The secret is to take bile supplements with each meal until your liver is repaired enough to make bile normally. You can get ox bile at most health food stores. If you don't have a gallbladder, you must take bile supplements with every meal the rest of your life or you won't be able to make normal cells. That means you will be sick. And then moving on to the next subsection here, it's called ATP ADP. We have been discussing the storage of electrons by the cells. We have discussed how cell membranes are primary capacitors to store electrons for use by the cells. This voltage is used primarily to control the electric circuitry of the cell membrane since it functions as a semiconductor, a diode, a transistor, and a microprocessor. Inside the cell, we have another electron storage system known as ATP slash ADP. This rechargeable battery system is used to make many of the cell's chemical functions work. Remember that when oxygen is available, we make 38 molecules of ATP from one unit of fatty acids. But when oxygen is unavailable, we only make two. 
This inability to provide electrons for critical chemical pathways of the cell is part of chronic illness. And the next section here is entitled the acupuncture system. And this is where things start to get a little spicy and kind of a little more applicable um, as far as understanding how energy works with and around our body. So Dr. Tennant continues, one of the body's wiring systems is the analog perineural nervous system. The other is the acupuncture system. Remember that both wiring systems are made of fibrous tissue. A sheath or cable made of fibrous tissue is called fascia. Fascia interpenetrates and surrounds muscles, bones, organs, nerves, blood vessels, and other structures. Fascia is an uninterrupted, three-dimensional web of tissue that extends from head to toe, from front to back, from interior to exterior. I encourage you to go back and read the section about semiconductors, diodes, transistors, and microprocessors. The fascias of the body are semiconductors, diodes, transistors, and microprocessors. These connect with and communicate with the cells of each organ. Remember that one of the characteristics of semiconductors is that electrons move in only one direction. This becomes important when considering how acupuncture meridians work. And there's, there's a lot of images in the body, especially as we go a little deeper into this chapter, that would probably be more useful if you had the book, but we'll carry on, and I'll, I'll do my best to describe them if necessary. He goes to say that in the images, you will notice that the fascia surround each muscle, connect with a fascial sheath that surrounds each organ, and then small fibers connect the sheets around each organ down to each little cluster of cells. In this way, each cell of the body is wired to the common wire that goes up the center of the back and down the center of the body. This is the acupuncture system. Helene uh, Langevin, MD, is a research assistant of neurology at the University of Vermont School of Medicine. She and her colleagues published a seminal article about acupuncture meridians. It's entitled, Relationship of Acupuncture Points and Meridians to Connective Tissue Planes. Number one, this, this is a list of things I, I think that are from the article that are important, and there's four of them. So, number one, acupuncture meridians traditionally are believed to constitute channels connecting the surface of the body to internal organs. We hypothesize that the network of acupuncture points and meridians can be viewed as a representation of the network formed by interstitial connective tissue. Number two, this hypothesis is supported by ultrasound images showing connective tissue cleavage planes at acupuncture points in normal human subjects. To test this hypothesis, we mapped acupuncture points in serial gross anatomical sections through the human arm. Number three, we found an 80% correspondence between the sites of acupuncture points and the location of intermuscular or intramuscular connective tissue planes in postmortem tissue sections. And number four, we propose that the anatomical relationship of acupuncture points and meridians to connective tissue planes is relevant to acupuncture's mechanism of action and suggests a potentially important integrative role for interstitial connective tissue. And thus, Langevin and her colleagues have shown us that the acupuncture system is essentially the fascial planes of the body. And just stepping away for a moment here, that's why I have adopted and have really fallen in love with yoga. Because, of course, it feels good to stretch and you kind of get your blood pumping and, and all that good stuff. But at a deeper level, pun intended, you're stretching, you're moving, you're mobilizing your fascial system. And as we learn about healing as voltage and how our bodies are energetically wired, the fascia and the fascia planes play such a significant role in your body's ability to transfer and move electrons and thus move energy in a normal manner to keep your body healthy. So for those wondering how they can increase their voltage, I think yoga is one of the, the better ways to do so, or Tai Chi, or just moving your body, stretching your fascia on a consistent basis to keep it pliable and keep that network open for electrons to freely flow. Back to the book. Remember that the fascia are made of fibrous tissue. 
Remember also that fibrous tissue has the least resistance to the flow of electrons through the body. Remember also that this tissue is an electron semiconductor, diode, etc. And the next section here, ionic transfer of electrons. Besides the two wiring systems of the body, the perineural system and the acupuncture system, there is an additional means of moving electrons from place to place. An ionic transfer within the blood plasma. This was eloquently described by Bjorn Nordenstrom in his classical book, Biologically Closed Electric Circuits. In summary, there are three ways in which electrons are moved from place to place. One is by the way of the wiring system known as the perineural nervous system. The second is by the way of the wiring system known as the acupuncture meridian system. The third is ionically within the blood plasma. In the next couple of sections here, I'm going to kind of go over briefly and then kind of get to the nuts and bolts of it. One is entitled, How Do We Measure the Voltage in Organs? And then another is measuring the voltage of organs using the perineural nervous system or acupuncture system. And so Dr. Tennant goes into the history of how healing of voltage in the body was understood, such as uh, 5,000 years old is the Vedas and the concept of chakras. So he goes into that stuff, heart chakra, throat chakra, third eye chakra, which is the pineal gland, crown chakra. He goes into Jinshin, or also called Jinshin Jiutsu, which is the system that consists of a therapist placing both hands on certain spots in a series of protocols to correct the flow of energy. So he goes into stuff like that, and then he continues to describe this bioterminal system that he developed based on his understanding and kind of interweaving all of these previously or historical thought processes of how the energy flows in the body, such as acupuncture and the Vedas and, and things of that nature. So I'm going to continue where Dr. Tennant begins to describe his system. So he continues, I found it difficult to believe that the body contained different systems that were not working together. As I continued to study various acupuncture texts, it became apparent to me that there were spots on the primary acupuncture circuits, such as the governor and conception meridians, where multiple meridians crossed. These points corresponded closely to the locations described for many of the chakras. Understanding that the acupuncture system is the same as the fascia system, I noted that the location of crossing points of the fascia were the same as some of the Jinshin Mirai points. Further examination of these facts led to the understanding that there is a primary cable that carries voltage up the back and down the front of the body. Also, there is a central terminal for each region of the body on that cable and that sends voltage to every organ in that region. So for example, there are points on the front and back of the skull that send voltage first to the right and left of the skull and then to each organ in the skull. The central terminal corresponds to what is classically called the third eye chakra. The lateral terminals correspond to what the Jinshin Mirai system calls energy spheres number 20 and acupuncture calls gallbladder 14 or GB14. So I began to call these switching points on the primary meridians switching terminals or bioterminals. I felt they needed a different name because they are close to but not the same as chakra positions. The lateral bioterminals are shown in the graphic. Notice that we had a central and right and left lateral bioterminals for the head, neck, upper chest, chest, abdomen, and pelvis. Note they are basically the same as the energy spheres described in Jin Shin as shown on the right. Look at the similarities between the bioterminals and the bands of fascia in the graphic. Now we have an easy way to determine the voltages of organs in each region of the body. Let's say you have pneumonia you will certainly have low voltage in the chest bioterminal. It may be front or back or both. If you have stomach ulcers, you will have low voltage in the abdomen bioterminal. Again, it can be on the left or the right or both. The locations of these bioterminals are noted above. And he has uh, some tables here with each bioterminal and, and the locations and what they relate to. So for the head bioterminal, it is between the brows on the front 
and the C1 or the cervical 1 on the back. The neck bioterminal is at the suprasternal notch in the front and at the C7 or cervical 7 on the back. The chest bioterminal is at the mid sternum in the front and the T5 or thoracic 5 in the back. The abdomen bioterminal is halfway between the bottom of the sternum and the umbilicus on the front and at T11 or thoracic 11 on the back. Lastly, the pelvic bioterminal is just above the pubic bone on the front and at L2 or lumbar 2 on the back. There is also a bioterminal on the top of the skull and in the perineum. It can be measured over the coccyx. Note that the bioterminal system has some similarities to the Kabbalah's trees of life. It also describes energetic pathways. There is a safety circuit that connects the main cables in case one gets shorted out. It runs from the bottom of the sternum to the coccyx. This safety circuit often is necessary after abdominal surgery creates a scar that shorts out the normal flow of electrons through the main cables. You can see how the electrons normally flow up the back and down the front. Now, imagine a scar on your abdomen from the surgery or an injury. It would short out the circuit. The body's defense against this is to use a detour from the xiphoid, which is the bottom of the sternum, to the coccyx. And this protects the vital brain and heart, but it leaves the pelvis organs with reduced voltage, resulting in pelvic disorders. To overcome this, there was another detour from C7 to the suprapubic bioterminal. This also allows some electrons to flow from C7 to the pelvis to overcome blockages. It is unfortunate that surgeons know nothing about the serious side effects of scars on the normal flow of electrons to organs via the acupuncture system of fascia. And the next section here is entitled, The Organs of the Body Are Wired Together as Tesla Circuits. The father of electricity was Nikola Tesla. He had a much more dramatic influence on electronic devices and the delivery of electricity than Thomas Edison. Nikola Tesla who was born July 1856 and passed away January 1943, was an inventor and a mechanical and electrical engineer. He was one of the most important contributors to the birth of commercial electricity and is best known for his many revolutionary developments in the field of electromagnetism in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Tesla's patents and the theoretical work formed the basis of modern alternating current, or AC, electrical power systems, including the polyphase system of electrical distribution and the AC motor, with which he helped usher in the Second Industrial Revolution. In 1895, Tesla invented the tuned circuit, or resonating circuit. It consists of a coil wired to a capacitor. When they are wired on a box-shaped circuit, it is called wired in parallel. Parallel tuned circuits are used in radio and other electronics to couple resonating energy from one circuit to another in transmitters and receivers. So in acupuncture theory, half of the organs are said to be yin organs and half are yang organs. And this is where it gets interesting, folks, so pay attention here especially. A yin organ is always connected to a yang organ. So it became apparent to me that the yin organs are capacitors and the yang organs are hollow organs that serve as coils. They are wired together through connected meridians to form Tesla resonating circuits. So the yin organs, again, capacitors, solid organs, are all wired to the main cables that run up the back. So again, yin organs, capacitors run up the back. Whereas the yang organs, are co are coils and hollow organs, are all wired to the main cable that runs down the front of the body. So yang are coils and hollow organs. They run down the front. So yin up the back, yang down the front. Yin is a capacitor. Yang is a coil. Yin, solid organs. Yang, hollow organs. So what is confusing at first is that the wires that form the Tesla resonating currents with each organ pane make a loop through either an arm or a leg. The loop also passes through a bioterminal. The loop connects in the arms or legs 
at what are called the Luau points in acupuncture theory. I hope I didn't say that wrong. It's L-U-O. One circuit that is unique is the liver gallbladder circuit. It controls the entire main cable system and is thus critical in the function of the entire system. There are two unusual names in acupuncture theory that are used in the same way the names of organs are used, but they are not organs. The names are triple burner or triple heater or sanjiao, S-A-N-J-I-A-O. These names are synonyms. The other unusual circuit is called the pericardium, although it has very little to do with the covering of the heart. The triple burner is part of the yang or hollow circuitry and the pericardium part is the yin or capacitor circuitry. In modern anatomy, the triple burner is the sympathetic nervous system and the pericardium is the parasympathetic nervous system. So just to step away from the book again and kind of, well, I guess he's going to recover it here. I was going to give you guys a review, but Dr. Tennant's going to do it here. So the triple burner which again is the yang goes down the front bioterminal of the skull and the pericardium, which is the yin capacitor, is wired to the back of the bioterminal skull. Thus, the autonomic nervous system composed of the sympathetic and parasympathetic monitor, the head bioterminals. The large intestine circuit is wired to the front neck bioterminal and the lung is wired to the back neck bioterminal. And so again, whenever it's in the front, it is a yang or a hollow circuit. When it is in the back, it is a yin, it is a capacitor. And and again, if it's in the front, being a yang hollow uh, organ, that means it's it's also a Tesla coil. So everything that I'm going to list off here, when it says the front, think... Circuit, hollow, yang. When I say the back, that organ is yin, it's a capacitor, and it's a solid organ. So we're going to go over all the uh, points here, front, back, front, back. So we already started the triple burner, which again is sympathetic, sympathetics in the front, parasympathetics in the back. That's another one. So the triple burner is wired. I'm going to repeat the first one again. The triple burner is wired to the front bioterminal of the skull. The pericardium is wired to the back of the bioterminal of the skull. So again, we have sympathetic in the front, parasympathetic in the back. So now we get into the other organs. The large intestine circuit is wired in the front neck bioterminal. So for a quick review, large intestine, since it's in the front neck, that's a front, that's a yang organ, that's a hollow organ, and that is a sympathetic organ. And the lung circuit is required on the back neck bioterminal. So the lung circuit, since it's in the back, that's a yin, that's a capacitor, that's parasympathetic. The small intestine circuit is wired to the front chest bioterminal. So again, front, that's yang, that's hollow, that is sympathetic, and that is a coil. And the heart circuit is wired to the back chest bioterminal. So again, since it's in the back, it's yin, it's capacitor, it's solid, and it is parasympathetic. So I'll stop repeating that now going forward. The stomach circuit is wired to the front abdominal bioterminal. The spleen circuit is wired to the back abdominal bioterminal. The bladder circuit is wired to the front pelvis bioterminal, and the kidney circuit is wired to the back pelvis bioterminal. The liver circuit is wired to the crown bioterminal, and the gallbladder circuit is wired to the base or root bioterminal. So remember that the liver circuit connects to the base bioterminal, and the gallbladder circuit connects to the crown bioterminal. I prefer to use the liver and gallbladder points on the knees instead of the classic luau points for these circuits since they do not require dealing with modesty issues. Also, one can use the the mu points for liver and gallbladder. Remember that Tesla circuits are designed to measure and adjust other circuits. There is a Tesla circuit for each pair of organs on each side of the body. 
The capacitors are wired to the back and the coils are wired to the front of the body. So let's think about that. We have a column going straight down our middle and on either side, we have these Tesla circuits for each organ. And as he said there, we have coils for the front and capacitors for the back. So when a bioterminal's voltage begins to drop, that is recognized by the associated Tesla current. It moves electrons from the arm or leg muscles to the bioterminal in an effort to modulate it back to normal. Thus, it is important to exercise to keep the arm and leg muscle batteries charged. The suprapubic bioterminal controls all of the yin organs, which are capacitors, solid organs, and the bioterminal at C7 controls all of the yang organs, which are hollow and coil organs. So if we step back just for a moment here and look at this picture, this is kind of the picture I'd want you guys to look at, um, and it really just like a painting, you know, says a thousand words. So is this picture, but I'll, I'll do my best to depict it. And it's just what we've been talking about, how it's just this person standing and we're looking at it from the side. So just a side view. And then it shows all of the so-called batteries or the negative charge of the batteries going up the back side of the body. And it starts um, in the perineum with the liver. And then as we go up the back, right at the lumbar spine, we have kidney, then we go up to thoracic, we have spleen, pancreas, then we go up to the shoulder blades, we have heart, then we go to the base of the neck, we have lung, then we go to the base of the skull, and we have parasympathetic, and then at the very top, we have, and so, just to step back again, so going up the backside, those are all yin, those are all parasympathetic, those are all capacitors, they store charge, and that's why they're the negative side of the battery. Um, so the opposite of the liver at the perineum at the top is the gallbladder. Remember, those two are connected to each other in their own way. Um, and as we go up down the front now, so as we go down, these are the yang, these are the circuits, or sorry, the coils, these is the sympathetic, these are the hollow organs, and they're all connected to the backside of the body. So as we go down the front here, the, at the top of the crown, we have gallbladder. At the forehead, we have sympathetic, which goes through the skull, connects to the base of the skull, parasympathetic. And then in the throat, we have large intestine. As we go through the throat, then we have the lung in the back. As we go down to the front of the chest, we have small intestine, and it connects to the heart in the back by the shoulder blades I mentioned. Uh, we have the stomach near the stomach, and as you connect to the backside, we have the spleen pancreas, and near the bladder, we have bladder connected to the lower back. We have kidney. So not only do we have this um, circuit those, that goes around in a circle in a clockwise fashion, meaning we go up the back through the yin, and then we go down through the yang, but they're also connected through the body front to back. The front side has the plus charge, sympathetic, and in the back, we have the negative charge or the parasympathetic. So there's all, this major circuitry going on. And then also, if we look at the person from the front, it's not depicted in this picture, but remember, we have Tesla coils on either side of our body, I should say. We have Tesla coils on the left side, Tesla coils on the right side that all relate to our organs. So not only do we have this circuitry going down the front, up the back, down the front, up the back, but we have it going front to back, front to back, front to back, front to back with all this electricity. But then also, we have Tesla coils on either side laterally going up and down the body, and they have their own way that they're connected and providing energy to each vital organ. And so to wrap up this chapter here on the last page, let me get there. Dr. Tennant finishes up. If one of the bioterminals is blocked, say by a scar, it backs up the flow of electrons to the one before it and to some degree the one before that. The detour circuits noted above can ameliorate this to some degree. When finding low or high voltage in the bioterminal circuits, look to see if the blockage of a bioterminal is causing higher voltage in the bioterminal before it and a lower voltage in the bioterminal or terminals after it. If so, you will want to be sure that there isn't a scar blocking the forward movement of electrons and open the bioterminal in front of the one in question then amplify the one behind it, and finally open the one that is the problem. It's like driving a car. You can't move forward if the car in front of you is stalled, even if the car behind you is trying to push you forward. So, in summary of this whole chapter, it's, it's a short summary, 
The cells in the body are designed to run at negative 20 to negative 25 millivolts. To heal, by making new cells, we must achieve negative 50 millivolts. We get chronically sick when voltage drops below negative 20 millivolts. When voltage drops below negative 20 millivolts, we get chronic pain. In addition, oxygen levels drop since they are controlled by the voltage level. When oxygen levels drop, metabolism changes to where we can only get two molecules of ATP instead of 38 molecules per unit of fat processed. Cells struggle to function when they are getting quote unquote two miles to the gallon versus the 38 miles to the gallon. In addition, the trillion or so bugs that are always in our bodies wake up when oxygen levels drop. They begin to have lunch by putting out enzymes that dissolve our cells. These enzymes enter our blood and damage cells throughout the body. Thus, chronic disease is always defined by low voltage. To measure our voltages, we can easily use the acupuncture meridians and the biomodulator. And the biomodulator is actually a tool that Dr. Jerry Tennant has invented or devised so you can measure all of these bioterminals and all of these Tesla circuits that we have in our bodies. You can literally measure it with this biomodulator to see where your voltage is lowest. And then like the process he described uh, not too long ago, let me briefly repeat it here. So uh, when you find a low or high voltage in a bioterminal circuit, you will want to be sure that there isn't a scar blocking the forward movement of electrons and open the bioterminal in front of the one in question, then amplify the one behind it and finally open the one that is a problem. So again, you do that with his biomodulator. And I'll tell you, I just did a quick search when I uh, first read this and it is not cheap. But if you actually go to the website, you can learn some pretty interesting things. Uh, and actually in this next chapter that's entitled The Bowling Ball Syndrome, which has a quick little deep dive into craniosacral therapy, which I knew a little bit of, but I learned a lot more. It's actually very fascinating, the mechanisms of craniosacral therapy and how the cerebral spinal fluid moves in your body and how your cranium um, and sacrum really move and breathe together, so to speak, and how if you correct this bowling ball syndrome, you can fix a lot of things. And a vast majority of people have this quote unquote bowling ball syndrome, which has to do with your head sitting on your neck. And you can fix this or at least diagnose it with this biomodulator or these other tools he has on his website. But again, they're not cheap. It's quite the investment. But if the results are as good as he touts and I mean, if you read the the book, you can clearly understand the mechanisms of actions and how it works and the results are real. So I would say it's a pretty good investment, but you're looking at thousands of dollars to do so. So regardless, that's the end of the chapter, guys. Healing is voltage. And that was one chapter out of, there's 16 total. I mean, that was definitely one of the longer chapters, but I hope it was at least fascinating, thought-provoking, and you know, um, just trying to throw some more energy healing at you guys, again, to expand your horizon. And, and of course, we're going to bring it back to light therapy and red light therapy. But just to understand that there is this circuit in our body, and not just that, but our each cell membrane is a capacitor that stores energy that communicates with the cells. We need to be regenerating or have the ability to regenerate or produce healthy new cells because our entire body is reproduced at a cellular level every eight months. So think about that. Every two years, all of your body tissues, all of your organs are replaced three times at least. Because of course, we know that the skin replaces itself more quickly um, and other organs replaces itself more frequently, whereas things like the brain and the nervous system reproduces itself at a slower rate. But again, every eight months, everything is recycled. So either you're recycling healthy cells, which are healthy tissues, healthy organs, healthy systems, or you're not. And that is aging. And it all comes down to having a higher voltage. So again, I hope that kind of gets the, the mind jogging a little bit, but I'll leave it there. Hope you guys are having a fantastic start to your summer. As always, 
get outside, get your full spectrum sunlight. That's a good way to raise your voltage, get some grounding in. When you can't make it outside, do your red light therapy, do your electron rich water, do your meditation, do anything that raises your voltage. And as always, guys, just take a quick 30 seconds. If you haven't already, leave a quick five-star review so more people can learn amazing information from this podcast. But most importantly, go out there, guys. Have a great summer. I'll see you guys next week. And as always, light up your health. Thank you for listening to the Red Light Report. If you like what you heard today, go ahead and leave us a review on iTunes and other podcast platforms to help spread the word so other people can learn about the many health, wellness, and longevity benefits of red light therapy. If you're looking for more educational content, check out our Instagram page at biolight.shop and our YouTube channel, Biolight. I'm Dr. Mike Belkowski, and I'll see you on the next episode.